thank you very much uh, for the organizers, ISDE, and uh, my colleagues and friends from around the world for participating and, and, and joining us on this wonderful day. Uh, welcome to our virtual presentation on uh, ERAS and perioperative care in esophagectomy. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Edward Cheong, uh, and I'm a consultant esophagastric surgeon at the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital in the UK, together with uh, Shiv Rajan, from, uh, who's a surgical oncologist at the King George Medical University in India, and Suzanne uh, Gisbert, a long-term friend and a phenomenal surgeon, upper GI surgeon and principal investigator at the Amsterdam, University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. We are your chairs for today's presentation. The ISDE, or the International Society for Disease of the Esophagus, mission is to promote and exchange uh, scientific and medical knowledge of the esophagus among specialists in the field. And we're happy to bring you this virtual presentation and discussion and webinar. And the most important thing for today is I hope you learned something and you, I hope you enjoy it, most importantly. Uh, over to you, Chef. So a very welcome to all of you. Uh, we are joined today by an outstanding group of speakers from around the world, and they will be introduced before they talk. Uh, the format of today's webinar will include a series of presentations, followed by two interesting cases for the discussion. Uh, we would like this presentation to be interactive. And for this, we will there will be an audience poll throughout this webinar, and participants will have around 30 seconds to submit their answers to the poll question. Uh, as the answers will remain anonymous, so don't hesitate. We would appreciate if you join the poll. And also we have live Q&A section, and we encourage you to type your questions at any time during this webinar by using Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. You can see that. And we would help with your questions, and our speakers would be happy to answer them all during the presentation. So without any further delay, Let's get started with this exciting session on ERAS and perioperative care in esophagectomy brought to you by International Society for Disease of the Esophagus. So I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Susan Gisbert to introduce our first speaker. Thank you very much. Welcome everyone. And I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Edward Chung. Um, he was a, he's a consultant esophageal gastric cancer and laparoscopic surgeon in um, uh, Norfolk and Norwich University Hospitals. He was also the lead there from 2010 to 2020. He introduced uh, the minimally invasive esophagectomy there and also the ERAS protocols. He learned it from uh, Lukatic, one of the pioneers in the minimally invasive uh, esophagectomy. He was a fellow there. Personally, I also learned a lot from him. He hosted the um, European think tank meeting where we watched uh, Ed do a minimally invasive esophagectomy very uh, beautifully. And also he told us the insertion of the paravertebral catheter, what, what also aids a lot in the ERAS protocols and to get patients mobilized earlier. So uh, Edward, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Susan, for your kind uh, introduction. Um, trying to see if I can move the slides. Um, control, okay. Um, the title of my talk is on prehabilitation and ERAS in minimally invasive esophagectomy. Uh, I don't have the ability to control my slide. Oh, here we go. I got it. Um, enhanced recovery program uh, is also known as fast track surgery in most of Europe and also enhanced recovery after surgery. However, it starts way before surgery begins. This is the key here to remember. The components of enhanced recovery program uh, includes pre-op or prehabilitation where you prepare the patient, uh, perioperative or intraoperative things that you do, um, and postoperative components. Have, these are the well-known factors that influence recovery. Uh, and from our point of view, we try to maximize those factors that accelerate recovery and minimize those that delay recovery. Pre-op preparations is very important. It's the counseling starts in the very first clinic when you meet the patient. You have to identify a key family member, and this is key. The, the things I, I tell them to do are very, very straightforward, but very intuitive. It is to eat well, train well, and do well. Basically, you are like the, the world's best football managers. 
in England. We have a lot of that. Um, and your job is to prepare and inspire them like the, the, the managers. You've got to get them to do the things that are best for them. Pre-op cardiovascular training is one of the big things that we do uh, well over here. And my preference is an exercise bike or brisk walking. And I'll talk more about it later on. Obviously, a, a healthy diet is very important. And those who are obese, we put them on a low-fat diet and get, get them to um, improve that aspect. That hence the eat well, train well, you tend to do well. All the patients that we operate, they must stop smoking. Nicotine is a definite no-no. Nicotine is a well-known vasoconstrictor. So we try in every way possible to get them to stay away from anything associated with nicotine. The counseling continues where we facilitate patient and family education. This helps to allay the anxiety. This helps to educate them and improve your outcomes. The provisions of both verbal and written information or even DVD uh, is important because then we're all trying to do the same thing from the time you meet them in the clinic and from the time you moved over to, to see the nurses and the times they see the oncologist as well as the dietitian, et cetera, we're all uh, repeating the same thing. So this repetition, repetition, repetition is important to make them a believer. Ideally, you have a dedicated enhanced recovery a practitioner nurse. We have one that holds monthly meetings with, with the help uh, and volunteer of a former patient to help up the patients who are coming up for their surgery. And this is really a key thing as well. Now, try to give clear instructions, especially about what to do after the operation as well. Early mobilization, deep breathing and exercises. We use DVD and training sessions for this. We tell them that, well, it's, it's impossible to have no pain. So you must expect some pain after this major operation. It is really impossible to have no pain, but we will help you. You try to get active participation from the patient and their family. And this is very important because then they have a buy-in. They try and they believe in your system. Now, the pre-op cardiovascular exercise I prefer is usually an exercise bike. It's not very expensive. They can purchase it um, and they can put it in front of the television uh, in, in the hallway uh, or in the living room. And this obvious the, the risk that they worry about in England, especially about the bad weather or the traffic out there or if they like, they can do the brisk walking. But at the end of the exercise program, uh, where, where they're doing 30 to 45 minutes twice a day coming up to surgery, they must be sweating. If they're not sweating, I tell them they haven't really pushed or they haven't really worked. Standardized clinical pathway. This is a seminal paper from uh, Don Lowe, who is one of the doyen of the world of esophageal surgery. And this made a significant improvement uh, in the care for esophagectomy patients around the world. And we, we came to, to this paper and, and added this. So with, along with our enhanced recovery program, the key here is that we are all singing and dancing to the same tune from the surgeon to the anesthetist, to the intensivist, to the, the dietitian including the junior members of the team, they all get educated by it and the patient and family are educated by the same thing as well. This is a, a standard integrated care pathway or standardized clinical pathway that we use, but it's similar to those that you have. But the key here is you got to keep it simple. It's a goal oriented program and you give them a target that they can achieve every day. This is what we do before the night before surgery. They have a proper dinner the night before and they have two bottles of this Fresvian two cows, which gives you about 800 kilocalories at about 10 p.m. They get their DVT prophylaxis uh, at 6 p.m. I also give them the Lansoprazole at 10 o'clock at night and, and 6 a.m. the next morning to reduce the secretions. The morning of the operation, they get Fresvian Juicy, 200 millicoils, one bottle, which is 300 kilocalories um, at 6 a.m. And the worry uh, from a lot of people who, who come across this is that you will have the possibility of aspiration. But we, at the time that they get their general anesthetic, which is roughly around eight o'clock, we perform an endoscopy first thing before the operation, but we have shown it time and time again, there is nothing left in the stomach. In those taking the beta blockers, we continue the beta blockers, but for those uh, who are on calcium channel blockers or ACE inhibitors, we stop them just to reduce the post-op hypotension. 
The evidence for pre-op carbohydrate loading is immense, especially from sports medicines, uh, but the randomized control trial came from colorectal surgery. It is a very cheap and uh, safe way of doing things, even for subject me patients. It's very well tolerated and improves their well-being. It attenuates your post-op stress response and improves insulin resistance. And ultimately, the most important, it improves your care and decreases your length of stay. Perioperatively, you need an anesthetic champion. You always need an anesthetic champion. And he's the champion for pain management. This is what we do. We give the patient spinal analgesia. We put in a paravertebral catheter with a high infusion rate, about 15 mils per hour. We give them an intercostal nerve block and they get a patient control analgesia. We avoid using the epidural and we have done that from the get-go. I won't talk too much more about uh, pain management, et cetera, because John Francis, uh, our speakers, will be giving that talk in detail, except I need to mention that minimally invasive surgery has an advantage over open surgery when it comes to enhanced recovery. This is an example of a paravertebral catheter, which we put in because we avoid putting a, a para, a epidural with the associated complications from uh, epidural. Perioperatively, now this is the key thing here. You know, when intra-op, when before the incision, we do preemptive analgesia. Basically, before the pain is inflicted, uh, we give uh, the analgesia. Good analgesia is key here. And again, we mentioned about spinal analgesia, paravertebral catheter, and intercostal nerve block. Sometimes you get a patient who's, uh, uh, who's still complain of pain from the excess wound or port size. And even on the ward, you can put an intercostal nerve block on two levels. This is not a, a difficult thing to do. The intercostal nerve block is the same thing that you put in uh, for your chest strains. And you, you use it and you put it on two blocks levels and it improves their pain. The, another key uh, to the enhanced recovery is early extubation early post-op mobilization, and early introduction of oral fluid and diet. This is what we do very, very quickly. Your post-op uh, enhanced recovery program starts in the theater recovery, not in the in high, high dependency, not in intensive care. We start in the theater recovery when they're out there. We get the patient's pain under control, get them coughing in, in three successive coughs to get things out, get them to move their legs and, uh, and exercise and fine tune everything elsewhere. And it is very important stage. This was a visit from uh, Richard and Yale, uh, along with the whole team from anesthetic team uh, about seven years ago. In your surgery, you can do things to help yourself and to help your enhanced recovery. In esophagectomy, we try to create a straight and narrow gastric conduit and put the conduit back in the native esophageal bed as best as possible. This creates better emptying. What you don't want is a, a a redundant gastric conduit in the right chest where there's fluid level and air level, so things are not moving through and you've got delayed gastric emptying. Uh, and this is not what you want. It doesn't help you uh, to promote your enhanced recovery program. So don't set yourself up for a fall. Post-op, we try to use smaller drains. This is a, a Jackson Pratt drain or JP drain, as you know, it's more comfortable. If there is a big chest drain, early removal of the big chest drain on day one or day two. Early removal of the NG tube is important to help them breathe and, and, and cough and, and, and walk. It's more comfortable for them to rest as well. And try to develop your enhanced recovery program in one ward and the HU. This is safer and it's faster. You have a smaller number of people to educate and teach. And remember, try to know your patients better. Try to see the patient two to three times a day at least and be widely available for education and repetition uh, because you won't, this is a long-term investment for the whole uh, department. Now, early post-op mobilization. The key here is you gotta walk and you gotta talk with them. You gotta help relieve the anxiety because this is what they have after the operation. And we, we always emphasize that we try to start the first walk with the senior surgeon or the surgeon doing the the operation. You've got to make these patients believe that they can walk after this operation. That's the very, very first thing, and they will do it. You get active participation from the family, and this is a guy who's with uh, the fluid pole walking around with his JP drain, is walking independently already. Now, the baby as turtle since thing is, is what I keen to when you see this. When the first baby turtle is hatched, it runs off and down into the water in the sea. And then suddenly with an instinct, 
from the rest, everybody comes up. And this is the same thing that you get uh, with enhanced recovery program. When one of the patients walking around and around the ward uh, by himself independently, the rest of the team will intuitively come out and run and walk around with them. And this is an excellent healthcare, which is free and it inspires them. It gets them doing, and they don't depend on physiotherapy or everywhere, and they feel great with themselves. So this is a free healthcare system. High risk patients, yes, they can go for enhanced recovery as well. In elderly patients, high mobility, they do well, uh, especially with minimum invasive surgery or robotic assisted minimum invasive esophagectomy. But the key here is you got to remember this high risk patient. This is not uh, a training case, so you you got to need a, an experienced um, or a surgeon doing it. Uh, this is not a training case, and this, there should be no basic major intraoperative errors allowed. And you can translate your uh, elective cases to soft emergency soft care patients. They do well with enhanced recovery program as well. This is an example of an 87 year old who's day three post MIE doing very well. You get them up, you get them walk, and they were carrying the JP drain for him, and it works. Early in the, in, in the years when I started working uh, and doing this, I was always worried of one thing my anastomosis. And that's the only thing I, I worry about, as do most of uh, the soft geo surgeons. So I, I did a lot of early uh, endoscopy uh, on day four, or day five before. Before I sent them, send them home. This early endoscopy for my circular stapler anastomosis, I learned to recognize that if I see this beautiful uh, white scar ring and a pink uh, gastric conduit, you're laughing because this patient is going to be eating and drinking at home tonight because he's doing very well. There's nothing here you're going to worry about. The conduit is empty, uh, it means, which means it's emptying well. Uh, you give them the drinks when they get home and they're going home. So. Uh, I did a lot of early endoscopy on day four, day five, day six, day seven, before they went home. These are your critical factors for success, but I can't emphasize more than enough. You need clinical champions. You need determined people. You need people who want to change things, to make things happen, and you need believers. And the key thing here is your patient and family education. You need patient and family education. Now, in every kind of uh, enhanced recovery program, you have a variety of them, and you need an enhanced recovery program that caters not only to the top 10% of uh, institution around the world. You want enhanced recovery program that works for 99% of the uh, institution around, that, that's easy to do, that's effective. So try to keep your enhanced recovery program simple. Keep it simple, and then everyone can do it. But if you make it complicated, it is going to be very difficult. So when you introduce it, stop being afraid of what you could go wrong and start being excited about what could go right. This is one of the key things about uh, our group. When we do things, we try to enhance it, keep it simple and make, make it exciting and make it workable. There are many enhanced recovery protocols around the world and they all have been validated. They all produce similar results. But the key here is this, protocols should be tailored to local facility and their available resources. It's very important. I was lecturing in Cairo and we talk about Fresubin. It's too expensive for them. They can't afford it. So we think about alternatives. Why not uh, a milkshake, a couple of milkshake uh, in the evening before the surgery, say at about 10 o'clock and in the morning, just a, a bottle uh, of uh, apple juice, for instance. This is our, our uh, first 300 consecutive total MIE with prehabilitation and enhanced recovery. And the key here is that however difficult the case or complicated the case, <clears throat> our median hospital stay still remains at seven days, uh, which is key here uh, in making us believe that we are doing something right. This is a famous day for us uh, and it goes with the African proverb. If you really want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, we go together. Thank you so much for your time and, and attention. And it's been an honor giving this talk. Thank you very much, Ed. That's a wonderful lecture. Thank you very much. Um, first, we do the second lecture of um, Don Lo, and then after that, we can uh, take the questions for both uh, presentations.